Cool. And I think we are now live. Howdy, everybody. Uh, Drex here, and I am home from Flame Festival, finally. Um, yeah, so I just wanted to use this live stream as an opportunity to kind of reconnect with all of you guys out there in YouTube land and, uh, you know, people who have, uh, who support the work that I do on here and are part of the online core community and everything. Um, so tonight I just wanted to open it up to kind of a generic Q&A, ask me about anything that you like from Poitrix to flow culture to any old thing that goes through your head. Uh, I kind of want to hear about what's important to you guys out there. So um, I'm going to start this off uh, first by, uh, while I'm waiting for you guys to uh, go ahead and queue up some questions for me. Um, I wanted to uh, tell you guys a little story. And actually, let me double check. Okay, cool. The stream is going. I, uh, I'm getting a little error message from YouTube saying that the uh, uh, saying that the amount of bandwidth isn't quite what I was expecting. But it looks like I'm still streaming because it looks like there are people commenting, which is great. Jasmine Marshall, awesome. Nice to see you. Um, I will. Uh, I will I'll get to your question in just a second. I want to. I want to give you guys a, uh, an opportunity to start getting some questions in. And to do that, um, I'm going to tell you guys uh, my favorite story of things that happened at Flame Festival because I had a really, really good Flame Festival. Um, so for those of you guys who don't know, I am part of the organizer team for Flame Festival. I'm one of the directors. And specifically, the responsibilities that fall under my purveil are workshops, working with the instructors, and uh, the fire circle and fire safety. Now we had a really, really, really epic rainstorm come through on Saturday night, which is supposed to be the last night of the event. And people uh, were really, really jazzed to get out there and spin. But the problem is, is that the weather just wouldn't cooperate. Um, we had really heavy rains during the afternoon and they led to the easy up that we usually cover the fuel depot with uh, collapsing do both to wind and rain. And so we had to come up with another option for covering it. And fortunately, there was um, a large uh, yurt uh, that somebody had erected during the afternoon that they were willing to let us borrow for the purposes of the fuel depot. And in the pouring rain, we dragged it over so it was on top of, um, so that it was on top of the fuel depot and we tried opening for the first time at 10 p.m., and the weather was too the, the weather was too bad for us. Uh, again, heavy rains, and the even even bigger problem, honestly, was that um, we uh, like the the storm. It, it was there. There was lightning, and um, I was going by the rules that I've seen for like storm photographers on this, which are people who take photographs of like lightning. And uh, the rules that they go by are that if you're photographing lightning and you are in the rainstorm, you are too close. So as long as there were lightning strikes, we wouldn't let people go out. So we'd wait five minutes and no lightning strikes. And then we would uh, go ahead and set people going and then the rains would kick up again and then there'd be lightning again. So we tried to open up at 10, close it down. Uh, we tried to open up at 11. And again, we had to close it back down. And then midnight comes around, and we're trying, and we're trying, and just people are exhausted. They're cold. They're wet. They're really unhappy. And finally, we just decided, okay, this is not going to happen. So we closed it down for the night, um, and which is something that I just felt terrible about um, because I was, I, I really felt like we were letting people down. Uh, at, at the festival and also letting down the people who would work so hard to try and get our fuel depot open. And I went to bed and I woke up again at 6 because I was the director on duty at 6 a.m. Then I walked out to the fire field and discovered that fire spinning had been going on for like four hours, that the storm had finally cleared. Hi there, Theo. Theo is the real star of all of my uh, live streams here. Theo is one of... Oh, is he showing up? One of our two cats, um, and definitely the one who uh, is a little bit more, uh, has a little bit more character and personality to her. But anyhow, 
So getting back to Flame Festival, I woke up at 6 a.m. and went out to find that the fire circle was running. And it turned out that what had happened was that um, the fire circle staff had just stayed out there around the circle deep into the night. And when there came to be a point at which the storm broke, they decided that they were going to go ahead and reopen the fire circle and uh, had made a call for volunteers, got people to help them out. And it had been humming away for four hours, and it made me so incredibly happy that fire spinning still happened on Saturday, on Saturday night into Sunday morning. So I sent everybody to bed uh, so that they could be awake for strike in a few hours and supervised the fire circle myself. And um, the, really, uh, the really cool part of that was that it felt like a really magical moment of people coming together to make a really beautiful thing happen. And uh, I wound up spinning fire myself that morning. It's really rare that I spin fire at fire festivals anymore, especially at Flame because I help run it. Um, and I'm always stressed and running around and trying to make sure everything's working and everything. And... Uh, there was a DJ who came on, uh, Danny Baltimore, who's a friend of mine, and um, he played a really, really fantastic sunrise set, um, like very, very light drizzles, the sun was rising and everything. And I was feeling really good and feeling really happy, so I told, uh, I told Danny that he could go ahead and add another song to his set if he wanted to. And Danny used this as an opportunity to, uh, to, to play a song special for me, which it, the first time he and I had ever met, he was DJing uh, a party that a friend of mine had thrown. And uh, he really impressed. He and I bonded over the fact that he played this one song, and I went up and talked to him after about it and everything. And uh, for those of you who don't know, the worst kept secret in the flow world is that I am a massive metalhead. And uh, he played Bodies by Drowning Pool for me as the sun was rising. And I will just say that, that in, in like, <coughs> pardon me, the like eight years that I've been running Flame, spinning to Drowning Pool as the sun was rising um, after, after a night of heavy storms is probably the most magical moment that I've had in all my time at Flame Festival. So that was pretty awesome. And... Uh, yeah, it really it made me happy to have been there and been a part of it and gotten to not only make a great event for other people, but also get to enjoy parts of it myself. So it was a really, really special moment. So now that I'm done yakking y'all's ears off about uh, my wonderful weekend, uh, I will start taking your questions. Um, again, ask me questions on any topic whatsoever. It could be poi. Flow arts related. If you got personal questions, I'm happy to uh, I'm happy to answer those too. And uh, yeah, I guess I will dive in. So uh, first up, we have Jasmine Marshall. Which uh, Jasmine, thank you for being the first person on the chat here. And Jasmine's question is, what is the best poi trip trick a beginner should do? Um, to be honest with you, Jasmine, I'm going to say that, and this runs counter to advice that I've given in other videos. When people ask me for multiple tricks to learn as beginners, I have multiple tricks that I tell them, but if they're gonna just learn one trick as a beginner, my answer to them is to learn how to do anti-spin flowers. Um, me personally, I think that flowers are the most important trick that you wind up learning in your poi journey. And anti-spin flowers are like among the most useful of those. So learn how to do anti-spin flowers as early as you can because um, it's one of those things that when you start getting into other territory with poi, like leaves and the like, um, it can be very easy to put flowers down. But flowers are really how you open up freedom of movement with poi, like being able to extend your arms and move them around in whatever ways you want to. So when people start out with you know, their standard weaves and butterflies and everything. Um, they're also training themselves to move their poi, but not their arms. Whereas when you train your arms to move as well, it opens up so many additional movement possibilities for you. So I have a, uh, a number of tutorials out there on how to learn anti-spin flowers, but the close notes are that you first want to learn how to do something called linear isolation which has far too long a name for what the trick actually is. But essentially what you're looking to do is um, 
it's a three beat trick where you're basically dropping the point down your center line, you're popping it up the middle, going back and forth, and you're dropping and popping, dropping and popping. And when you drop the point head then, you drop your hand, and when you pop the point head up, you have your hand go up as well, dropping and popping, dropping and popping. This is a really intuitive way to learn anti-spin flowers that I picked up from Alien John many years ago. And I think personally is, is the best way of learning anti-spin flowers. So I recommend that you start there with your flat plane moves and everything. Because quite frankly, once you start getting into you know, hybrids and uh, body tracers and things like that, what you're going to find is that they're really based in doing flowers. And weaves are something that you can save for a little while, and butterflies too. Flowers are really where it's at. So, Jasmine? That is, uh, that is the one trick that I would say a beginner should really get into as soon as they can. Uh, Jasmine also says, I feel like a complete idiot. I just started, and you're my savior. I'm glad I'm helping you out, but you should never feel like an idiot when you're learning. Like Nobody pops out of the womb being able to do this stuff. Um, I posted a video recently about my very first poi lesson, which was a complete disaster. Um, and part of the reason for that was that, uh, you know, there were a lot of motor skills that I had to learn in the process of learning how to spin poi, and never begrudge yourself that learning process. You, 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 when you can already do something, you don't learn anything from the experience. So, yeah, in, enjoy that learning experience, because it is good. Um, Cool. Also, I will just drop, guys, if you want to uh, help out the channel and help me out, um, there's a function called the Super Chat. If you're on your laptop, there's a, in, in the chat bar here, there's a little square with a dollar sign in it. And if you've got a dollar or two that you can spare, it helps out the channel. It helps me out, too. So thank you in advance. Uh, Lightwave1 says, I'm learning behind the back three beat weave starting in backwards direction. I keep hitting the back of my calves when trying to turn. Any tips? Yes. Uh, thanks, P.S. Nice cat. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, again, I think P.S. is the real, uh, the, the real star of these videos, right? Cool. So behind the back weeds, I can almost guarantee I know what's happening if you're hitting uh, the back of your calves, which is, uh, I watch for that too, um, which is that you're not turning your upper body as you do it. Um, like, when you start out doing the behind the back weed, our clones wind up just like a little bit tilted to the outside, and that's why they wind up hitting our calves so much. And the likelihood of that happening, whoop, right there, there, increases dramatically if we don't move our upper body around. Um, the way around this is that you start to realize that it's a good practice to be able to turn your upper body as you're doing the behind the back knees. Um, there's two reasons for this. One is that it takes less energy to uh, complete behind the back weave, where it starts coming from your body core instead of from your arms. And the other reason is practical. When your body is like at a wide angle like this, like now, then you're presenting a bigger target for the poi to hit. When your body is in profile like this, you're presenting a smaller target for the poi to hit. So it is less likely for that to happen. Yep. So, Interestingly enough, um, I actually have learned how to do the, I, I had to learn how to do the behind the back weave twice, because I forgot how to do it at one point. And the thing that, this is the weirdest thing in the world, but the thing that finally made it come together for me was learning how to do giants. That is these split time, same direction reels that you do with extensions, yeah? And in doing these, you have to move your body around from your core. And there's something about practicing these that jogged the core movement for me so that when I went back learning how to do behind the back weaves, I started doing them from my core, and lo and behold, I wound up being able to do them without hitting myself. So that's, uh, that, that is the cliff notes on, on how to do that. Wonderful question, wonderful question. I know a lot of people actually struggle with that. Um, and if you want more tips like these for um, how to do behind the back weaves, um, there's actually, uh, if you go to my learning site at learn.drexfactor.com, um, there is a course called Beyond the Basics that covers a lot of behind the back moves, including behind the back weaves, behind the back waist straps, 
um, and meltdowns, and it goes far more into detail about how to get behind the back roofs down. So I would highly recommend that you check that out. Oh, David Rothkopf, thank you so much for the two dollars. That is wonderful. I really appreciate that. Um, if you have any, uh, if, if you have any burning questions, David, please drop them in the uh, please, please drop them in the chat here, and I will uh, I will prioritize them first. Cool. So Dale Sean says that is great. I'm assuming in regard to my flame story, which is awesome. I'm glad you enjoyed that. Uh, Kurt Hobbs, Drex, you are the man. Everything I know about spinning poi is thanks to your awesome tutorial videos. Thank you, Kurt. I am so glad to hear that they are helping you out. Um, definitely, I hope that they make Poi more accessible uh, to those of you out there who are on your flow journey. Lucy Bell says, how do you keep yourself motivated when learning to nail the basics? I'm still struggling, struggling to do forward tuck turns. Um, a couple ways. Um, so one of those ways is that, well, okay, so let's back up for a second here. Um, so when you're working on basics, I know it can feel like progress is limited and comes in fits and spurts. Um, and that feeling really sucks. And feeling like you're not making any progress is one of those things that makes you question whether you should keep on going. Um, the biggest tip I can give to anybody who is working on trying to practice regularly is to not think of your practice as being necessarily um, the pursuit of an end goal. Like your practice is not done once you learn how to do a three beat weave. Practice, start trying to treat practice as a reward in and of itself. Um, you know, one of the ways that I, I tend to approach my own practice is I'll sit down for like an hour and a half and I'll say, okay, I'm going to drill one hand poi stalls for the next hour. And my goal inside of that hour is to get 10 stalls in a row. If I don't get there in the next hour, then it's not the end of the world, but at least I'll have put in the hour of effort, right? Um, and interesting life hack that I have picked up recently is um, one thing I've started doing while I practice is uh, listening to podcasts. And specifically like, um, you know, Radio Lab or Freakonomics or, or podcasts that tend to be about an hour long um, because they're a great way of internally timing myself to do an hour and, and keeping me engaged during that time. Um, so yeah, learn to love the practice, have something that helps keep you engaged during that time. Um, and also just realize that all of the most awesome boy spinners in the world at one point started where you are right now. So you have good company. And the only difference between you and them is that they had a couple years a head start on you. So think, think, of, think of the only thing that separates you from being that rock star is the time that you need to invest in it. Yeah, so good luck. Thank, thank you, Lucy. That's a great question. Kurt Hobbs says, I am having trouble executing orbitals with my fire poi. I feel like the chain makes it more difficult. Is this common and what can I do to fix this? Um, so <clears throat> the short answer is yes and no. Isn't that satisfying? Um, so I know what you're talking about, how like the chain tends to catch. And if, if you are in a place where your orbitals are still like in the process of being cleaned up and everything. Um, the way the chains catch can be a problem because they'll catch in the wrong place. The flip side is if you try doing it with something like Technora that doesn't catch, if you still got your swivels in there and everything, what you're gonna find is that the point of contact between the two tethers is very slippery and it's very easy to lose. So chains are really, really hard to work with when you start on orbitals, but once you have them down, uh, I think the chains actually do help. Oh, thank you, Rob Davis. Thank you for the, uh, for the $2 super chat, Rob. Outstanding. Um, I'll get to your question next then, Rob. Um, yeah, so it is, the short answer is, is that um, 
the chains suck when you're starting out because uh, they they kind of call you out on any small issues you have with your technique in getting into the orbitals where the, the, the tethers catch and everything. Um, but that is really, really nice to have once you've got the placement down is the short answer. Yeah. So, um, yeah, I would say trains for, for orbitals, not a bad move. Um, keep up with the practice and like clean them up and everything. And eventually you'll find that they actually really, really help you out. Yeah. Cool. Thank you. Good question. Um, so Rob, what is the, the, and I'll go back and grab the other questions later, but, um, being as how Rob was so kind to help me out, I want to help him out uh, real quick here. Uh, Rob Davis, what is the best beginner way to bring poi across your body from one side to the other? Um, I don't know if you're referring to what I would call a tic-tac or what some people have referred to carryover. So a tic-tac is this move right here where you're spinning the poi back and forth across and something looks like a tube, right? Um, I think the other thing you might be referring to is what's sometimes called a carryover. You bring the poi all the way around your body and back, as though you're kind of simulating uh, a waist wrap. Um, they're both based on tic tacs, though. And here's the clip notes on how to get uh, tic tacs down. Um, so basically, you want to start off with the poi just like hanging in front of your, in front of you. And I want you to realize that there's basically two sides the arm. Um, there's what I refer to as the inside, which that's the side that when you flex your elbow, it brings your arm closer to you. And then there's the outside, which uh, that's when you stretch your arm out, your arm moves away from you, right? So it's inside, outside, inside, outside, right? So the goal is we want to switch the poi from being inside to being outside and back again, right? So with the poi hanging from my hand like this, what I'm going to do is I'm going to swing it up past my elbow, and I should see it go forwards away from me, right? Cool. And now that I've stopped it here, I want to swing it up past my opposite shoulder, past my left shoulder, right? Cool. So past my right shoulder, past my left shoulder, past my right shoulder, past my left shoulder, past my right shoulder, past my left shoulder. And as you get up to speed on this, what you're going to see is that there's a point that the point crosses through and it's uh, furthest away from you. We call this a cross point. Um, and it is what facilitates you moving the point back and forth across your body. Yeah? And then to turn this into a carryover, we also have to add a reverse tic tac. The reverse tic tac starts off exactly the same way with the point hanging in front of you, but this time you want to push the point away from you and see it drop past the outside and then past the inside. So it drops past your right shoulder, it drops past your left shoulder. Your right shoulder, your left shoulder, your right shoulder, your left shoulder, right? Okay, so now we're going to move back and forth between these two things. So what I want you to do is go ahead and plant your feet and then turn your upper body to the right here, yeah? And I want you to swing your poise so that it passes by your right shoulder. And then when it comes to be in front of you like this, I want you to turn your upper body around and uh, pass it by your left shoulder on the reverse side, right? Now, when it comes back around from your left shoulder, um, you're going to swing it up past your left shoulder and then past your right shoulder, yeah? So you swing it past left shoulder, left shoulder, right shoulder. Going left, to right. Left, to right. Left, to right. Left, to right. And in that way, it can work all the way around your body, yeah? Um, I hope that's what you were asking. Uh, oh, like from a weave, like a weave from one side to another. Waist wraps. Gotcha. Okay. So, sorry, I'll take one more second to answer this one. So the clips notes on waist wraps are that if you've got your forward weave and your reverse weave, is to start working on realizing that there's a point of those two weaves that are exactly the same. To do that, um, again, start with your feet planted, and um, because my dominant direction is always clockwise, I'm going to start with my left hand hopping up and over my right, entering into a weave as I face off to my right. Now you see that my upper body is pointing completely to the right as I do this, right? 
Now, there's a moment when my cord come back over to my left here, and my arms have an opportunity to open for a second. It's right before the left-hand cord goes on top, and the right-hand cord goes on the right. So what I'm actually going to do is I'm going to stop my two hands when I get there. And now I'm going to take my right hand forward, and I'm going to work it underneath my left, and go into the reverse sweep, facing my left hand side, yeah? And again, when I get my two forward over to my right hand side here, there's this moment right here, where my arms are separated, and uh, my right hand is preparing to go under my left hand, and I can stop right there. And again, switch over to the forwards on my right hand side, by letting my left hand go over the right, and then opening back up, letting my right hand go under my left, and opening back up, my left hand going over my right, opening back up, my right hand going over my left, and opening back up. Now as I'm describing this, you'll note that I'm talking about left hand going over, and then right hand going under. And here's the thing, that's exactly the same thing, right? Because if the left hand goes over, then the right hand must be under as well. So what you want to do then is stop for a second in the middle, go forwards, open, go reverse, open, go forwards, open, go reverse, open, and then try just pausing for a second in the middle here, letting your arms separate out, and continuing on your merry way. Arms separate, left goes over. Arms separate, right goes under. Arms separate, left goes over. Arms separate, right goes under, yeah? And eventually, you'll just be able to go straight back and forth with them, keeping your hands together the entire time. Yeah, and that is uh, that is the recipe for uh, together a waist wrap. Thank you, Rob, for the great question, and thank you for the two dollars super chat. That is awesome, and I really appreciate you. Thank you. Uh, cool. I'm going to jump back up here and see what some of the other questions we were working with were. Um, I answered Kurtz. Please tell me your kitty's name is Poi. No, um, we, we have two cats. Um, the first cat's name is Shiloh, and the other cat's name is Theo. Uh, they are both girls, and uh, they have very different temperaments. Um, Shiloh is very cuddly and enjoys being the center of attention. Theo, not so much. Um, but Theo and I have, have a unique understanding. Um, Jasmine Marshall says, Cute Kitty, you're such a great instructor. I'm assuming that you are referring to the cat, and I agree with you. Um, let's see here. Jesse Ratfield says, What do you prefer for poi heads? Do you prefer rounded cathedral or teardrop? Also, do you have any tricks for breathing fire? Um, not for breathing fire. I've never done it, and I, I never intend to. Um, the risks associated with it are just things that I'm, I'm not terribly interested in, in taking on. Um, almost everybody that I know that has uh, done fire breathing has given themselves chemical pneumonia at some point, and uh, I don't need a trip to the hospital. Thank you very much. Um, <clears throat> so, fire wicks. So the fire wicks I use right now, which I am totally in love with, are a pair of Nova heads from Dark Monk. Um, they're kind of like an Isis knot in that they are um, kind of a lanyard fold with, Kev with, with Kevlar rope rather than Kevlar tape. Um, and they have an additional layer of rope that kind of wraps around it to make it look a little bit more distinctive and everything. One of the things I love most about these wicks is that they are so absorbent that I almost never have more than a drop or two of uh, fuel spin out that comes out of these. They stay lit for an incredibly long time. They've been very durable, and uh, they, they they hold on to fuel beautifully. So they are my preferred fire poi right now. Um, even though I've done testing that shows that um, uh, that monkey fists, the rounded ones, um, are the most efficient poi heads when it comes to burn time and uh, fuel retention efficiency and everything, I just don't like the way that they feel. Um, I like having heads that feel is somewhat like a barrel, but that's totally up to personal preference, and, and yours might be different. Find what works for you. Yeah. Um, Rob Davis, what is... The, oh, I already answered that one. Um, Oz Ryu 
Ray Osen, I don't know, um, decided to learn how to spend some pretty colors instead of bugging everyone else to do a show for me. Thanks in, th thanks in advance for all the videos of yours I'll be referring to. Sure, my pleasure. Like I said, the videos are here to, uh, to, to, to help you guys learn and grow and help me keep on like helping you guys. Like, I, I don't know if, if folks have noticed, but a lot of the ideas that I get for my videos come from these here live streams and hearing questions from you guys that I imagine other people must have as well. So whatever you've got going through your heads, please ask away, ask away, because me helping you right now also helps me help other people. There's a lot of helps in that sentence. Yeah. Uh, Warren Woodruff, my shoulder is starting to hurt after spinning. How can I fix it? Do you do warm-ups? Yes. Um, so here's the most common warm-up that I do, especially when it comes to shoulder stuff. So I'll take a few minutes before I actually start spinning, and I'll just like walk around in circles. And what I'll do is start rolling my, uh, I, basically, there's four different points that I start warming up. I'll roll my wrists backwards eight times, and then I'll roll my wrists forwards eight times. And I don't know if you guys can hear this, but I am a 30 plus year old dancer, so my joints tend to snap, crack, and pop like Rice Krispies. Um, and then I will roll shoulders back eight times, and roll shoulders forward eight times. Roll elbows back eight times, and then roll elbows forward eight times. And then I'll reach up right side, left side, right side, left side, so I get eight stretches on each side of my body, right? And partially what this does is, um, if you haven't been using your arms that heavily, the, um, the, the uh, sockets of your shoulders can actually dry out a bit, and if you just like, go to do strenuous activity with them, you can actually grind bone against bone in there and do a little bit of damage. Whereas when you do these warm-up exercises, um, you essentially move whatever fluid and lubrication you have in the joint around a little bit to make sure that your shoulders are, you know, good and, hi there, hi there, yeah, um, are, are good and limber before you get started. Another tip, too, is that, like, you know, as you're, say, practicing your timing and direction, let's say, in, like, split time offices and everything, this actually is an old tip from, um, uh, from Yuda. But um, as you're doing this, practice with your palms always pointing up. Here's why. If you, say, do this with your palms pointing down, you see how I get a different line in my shoulder then, where um, I'll come up a little bit closer to the camera so you can see the difference here. So this, this right here, is with my palm pointed down, and as you can see, I have my um, my my. Uh, I think this is the humerus. Hey, heel, heel. That's not your toy. Heel. Sorry about that. Um, so basically, I have the humerus on top of the shoulder joint, whereas if I go with palm up, you see how my uh, my humerus. Uh, kind of falls into the shoulder joint, this is your happy place. This is where you want to be for all of your shoulder movements. Um, the biggest reason being that if you're up top like this, um, there are muscles that you can pull in here with to, with, 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 uh, if, if you put too much effort into it. Whereas this right here, uh, make sure that the bones are all aligned as they should be and um, make sure that you don't pull any muscles or tendons or anything in a bad direction. So those those are two ways that you can protect your shoulders as you warm up. Great question. Great question. Um, Jasmine Marshall says, is there any way I can keep in contact with you outside of this? I have so many more questions. Yes. Um, you can write to me at either drex at drexfactor.com or if you like my Facebook page, which is at facebook.com slash drexfactorpoi, you can send me messages there. Um, but do be, do be warned, um, I am notorious for not getting back to people in a timely fashion because a lot of the time I sit and I think over what I want to tell people for a very, very, very long time before I actually do write them. Um, but I get every message and I think about every message um, and I, I get back to people when I feel like I have an appropriate response for them. So I, I hope that helps. David Rothkopf says, hey, Drex, your videos have given me much more value than $2 over the last two months. 
but alas, I am on a tight budget. I really appreciate the two dollars, then, David, because I know what it's like to live on a uh, on a tight budget and giving what you can to help others. Like it, it really means a lot. Thank you so much. Um, yeah, and if any of you guys have a couple bucks that you don't mind throwing to the channel, please feel free to use that uh, that super chat function, the little box with the dollar sign in it at the bottom of the chat here. Um, helps me out, helps the channel out, it helps me be able to keep on bringing videos to you guys, so thanks in advance. Anyhow, um, da -da -da, Feed 4 kids says, Hi Drex, how was it for you to adapt to the artist life? How do you manage the transition? It was easy? No, it was not easy at all. Um, so, it really messed with me, to be honest with you. The first, like, I, I remember very distinctly the first several weeks after quitting my day job and just, like, spending poi full time. Or it wasn't really poi full time. Like, I was, I was also, like, you know, working as a, an independent contractor building websites. Um, but those first few days, I remember just, like, spending a lot of poi. And all of a sudden, I was, like, overcome with awareness of how I spend my time. And here's why. Because when you're sitting at a day job, you can have a day where you're basically useless and don't get anything done. You know, maybe you put in a half an hour of work, or maybe none at all. But you still get paid for it. Um, and it suddenly dawned on me that I wasn't getting paid to mess around anymore. And that really freaked me out. Um, that was... That, that was one of those moments where I kind of sat there and realized that I had to get my act together and I had to get my act together really fast. Um, yeah, it's, um, it was a hard transition and it's still a hard transition. Um, I don't feel by any means that I have mastered the artist's life in any way, shape or form. Um, if for no other reason than working for yourself is this constant struggle of balancing your passions with your need for income. Most days I have things that I want to do with my videos and I get really, really tempted to, you know, just go out and be creative and do those things and everything. And then inevitably I'll, I'll have moments where I kind of come back to earth and I'm like, well, why didn't you try and like book a lesson today? Or why didn't you... Um, you know, work on writing another online course today and everything. Because the creative challenges are really fun and the stuff that brings money in frequently isn't. Um, so finding the balance between those two things, even even if you're living the artist's life, can be very difficult. Um, so, yeah. No, it wasn't easy at all. <laughs> uh, but thanks, Keith. Uh, good question. Um, and I'm going to jump a question here right quick because and Young Inside German says, thanks for your tutorials, everything I know I learned from you. If I will have a credit card, I will I, I send you some money. I appreciate it. Um, and if, if any of you guys for any reason want to skip the uh, Super Chat, and um, absolutely every single dime that you send via Super Chat actually does go directly to me. YouTube does not take a cut of it at all. Um, but yeah, if for any reason you want to uh, donate otherwise, you can sign up at my Patreon, which is at patreon.com slash drexfactorpoi. Um, and you can sign up for as little as a dollar a month there, and you get uh, videos the day before the rest of the world does, um, as well as behind-the-scenes stuff. I show you how I make my videos, how I edit them, how I create um, my, my home studio, uh, things like that. And... Uh, yeah, if you donate enough, you get your name in the credits. So um, that's one way. And the other way is if you want to uh, just like PayPal me a couple dollars just because, you can PayPal me at ben.drexler uh, at gmail.com. So, yeah, cool. I'll get back to the questions here. Um, Justin Bresky says, Hey, Drex, I can do most of the poi basics. My prop of choice is two whips, though. I'm looking for some cool poi moves I could use for whip cracking. I can already do the three beat and counting pretty often. Um, then I would suggest butterfly tricks. Um, basically, your happy place is going to be anything that requires very little hand movement because unlike poi, um, whips have a phenomenal reach to them. Interestingly enough, um, I don't know if you guys are familiar with a poi spinner by the name of Arashi. Um, 
Arashi has a very interesting and incredibly unique style. And part of the reason for it is that Arashi's background is actually um, in whips. And so Arashi tends to treat poi as though they are short whips. And that means that he does very, very odd things that no other poi spinner does in terms of manipulating the tether and sometimes almost like trying to crack the poi. It's very strange. Um, but he also does very cool 3D things with them. So um, I would actually recommend you look up some Arashi videos. And I, I, I have a feeling that once you see Arashi videos, you'll kind of like in the back of your head have a moment of recognition. It's like, oh yes, I see how, I see how Whip has informed a lot of this. Um, yeah, so I would concentrate on things that actually don't require a lot of hand movement. So, you know, three beat weaves, waist wraps, um, probably five beat weaves, uh, fountains, windmills, Poitrubian man, uh, butterflies. Yeah, that's, that's where I would go with that. That's where I would go with that. Yeah, I hope that helps. Um, unfortunately, I, I, I have never picked up a, well, no, that's not true. I have picked up a whip before, but not for more than a couple minutes. Um, so unfortunately, like, whip is one of those props that I just, I, I've never gotten into. So I, I have kind of a limited capacity to offer advice on it. Sorry. Um, Rob Davis says, perfect, thank you. You're very welcome. Uh, Kurt Hobbs says, other than poi, what are your favorite props? Um, I also really enjoy spinning double staff and this past weekend at Flame was actually really fun because I taught my first double staff class in several months. And it was actually the first time I picked up the, my double staffs in several weeks. Um, and it felt good to kind of brush out some of the cobwebs there. Um, so double staff is probably my next favorite after poi. And then I also love to hoop. But hooping is something that I very, very deliberately do when nobody is watching. It is something that I will only do for myself. Um, so... Unless somebody has gotten video of me without my knowledge, it is not something you'll see me do. Uh, but yes, thank you, Craig. Good question. Uh, Jesse Ratfield, I'm heading y'all out, y'all. Have a good day. You too, Jesse. Have a great day. Um, Anyangan Siderman says, thanks for the tutorials. Everything I know I learned from you. Hey, and everything you know, you learned from you too. Um, if I... Oh, I already got to that one. Yeah. Um, Feed 4 k says, amazing answer, straight from the heart. Thank you so much for sharing that. My pleasure, Feed. Um, yeah, I think, so I have this thing where very frequently the narrative, especially in countercultures, is that, like, you know, it's pursue your passion, like follow your dreams and everything. Um, and while I think it's good to do things that are personally fulfilling, um, follow your passion, follow your bliss is not a business plan. <laughs> um, and I think that people really need to know that going down the route of being self-employed like that is really hard. Um, it's not, I've heard so many people say over the years, you know, follow, follow your passions and the universe will guide you and everything. And I don't know if that's other people's experiences, but it's not my experience. <laughs> oh, Rolando Arietta, thank you so much for the $1.99. I really appreciate it, Rolando. Um, thank you, thank you, thank you for contributing to the channel. It means a lot. It means so much. Um, but yeah, get it, getting back to that. Um, so it's hard because... So here's the biggest reason why being self-employed is hard is because... You know, when you work someplace, whether it's at a business or like, you know, government or, or what have you, you know, you have a place where everybody has a specific function. And even if that function isn't actually that useful, they have a specific uh, skill set that they're supposed to be bringing to the, an organization. You know, like, it's, it's like the organs in the body, how, you know, your liver does certain things like filtering out uh, toxins in your body. Um, you know, and your brain processes sensory information and thinks through, and your eyes, like, bring in sensory information and everything. Everybody inside an organization has a specific role. Um, and usually, over time, people get to be quite skilled at those roles. Now, when you become self-employed, you have to take on all of those roles. 
And a lot of those roles may not be roles that you're particularly well suited to. Like, I feel that I'm really, really good at the creative stuff and I'm really, really good at marketing. But I'm horrible when it comes to things like, you know, sales or um, just like client interactions and things like that. Um, and being self-employed, these are things that I have to work on. I don't get another choice. And sometimes that's a really amazing opportunity to grow into a role that you might otherwise never have been. Um, and <laughs> sometimes it is just an exercise in never-ending frustration for something you just never feel like you're going to get good at. Um, the, the thing that I continue to struggle with after you know five time five years of uh, of doing this full time is how to convert the things that I do the creativity that I put out there and the things I'm able to build um, into real income um, you know I have my online courses at learn.drexfactory.com um, I have my Patreon which is wonderful and the it, it, it just continually amazes me that the stuff that I do means so much to people that they're willing to, you know, throw a few dollars at me every month to be able to keep on doing it and keep on creating. Um, that, that relationship is really, really powerful, and it means quite a lot to me. Um, and then, of course, there's things, too, like I've tried selling T-shirts and pants over the years, and neither one of those things has really worked out terribly well. But, you know, having promo codes with different companies and the like, there, there, there's a lot of different options out there. Um, but yeah, the, the money coming in thing is something that I, I have always struggled since, since day one and I continue to struggle with today. And there have been other victories that I've won over the years. Like, um, I feel like I've become a very accomplished video editor. Um, and I feel like I have gotten a lot better at figuring out like topics for videos that are really going to help people out there and telling a story visually. Um, but yeah, there. So, if you're really interested in like becoming a full-time artist, um, I would highly recommend picking up a book called *The E Myth Revisited*. <clears throat> and I will say up front that, like most business literature, there is an uncomfortably large amount of it that is the author stroking his own ego. But at the core of it is a really, really good point, which is that just because you're a talented artist or a talented craftsperson or a talented editor, a talented, you know, whatever. That doesn't mean you're a talented bookkeeper. That doesn't mean that you're a talented marketer. That doesn't mean that you're, you know, a talented uh, accountant. Um, and if you're going to be an independent artist, if you're going to be an entrepreneur, you, you have to learn these skills. Um, and it guides the reader through some exercises that are really helpful for that. You know, thinking of what you're going to be doing as a business and think of the different roles that it's going to need. Like, if you were going to create, you know, Me Incorporated, um, what roles would be necessary to make Me Incorporated work? Which I think the interesting thing about that is you're almost always going to find that the structure of that looks quite similar to the job that you have just left, um, or the structure of the organization that you've just left. Um, and you'll find out really quickly that you're not always the best boss for yourself. Um, yeah, that, that tends to be a struggle. So, um, yeah, I, I also don't mean to be a wet blanket here because I, 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 I've learned and grown in such tremendous ways in the past five years having to be, having to be an independent uh, artist and entrepreneur that I really appreciate. And as I was, I, I, I was talking to a friend just this past weekend about the skills that you learn doing that and how, you know, if I had gone into like marketing professionally, um, I certainly would have been fired from a job by now for how little I knew and how little I was able to put together. Um, and it's really, really nice to be able to have the flexibility to learn those lessons and be able to bounce back from them on your own time. So. Much longer answer than that question probably uh, required, but there it is. Anyhow, um, yeah, Duche Performer says, Thanks for sharing your skills and talents continuously. May God bless you more. I learned a lot from your tutorials. Thank you so much, Duche. Thank you. Um, I, I hope that I continue to be blessed as well. Because, uh, 
it's nice to be on whatever deities exists good side. Uh, Kurt Hobbs says, when you started learning to spin poi, was there a point where you plateaued for a while or found difficulty getting to the next tier of your flow? Yes. Um, I have hit lots of plateaus over the years. Um, I would argue that I'm probably in one right now. Um, I don't freak out about plateaus, though. Um, and the biggest reason why is that if you're going to learn any given skill, it is a given that you're going to spend a lot of time on plateaus. And so you have to kind of re like make your peace with that early on because um, it is something that you can't change about the process, no matter how much you may want to. Um, there's a great book by a guy named George Leonard called Mastery. And in it, he basically outlines the techniques of people who've mastered different uh, talents and skills that he has interacted with over the years. And um, what a lot of it boils down to, he found, is that people who attain mastery are people who learn to love the plateau, that learn to see the plateau as an opportunity to polish and refine all of the things that they learned in their last burst of acquiring new pieces of skill and everything, and that they look at the plateau as an opportunity to reinvent themselves, um, to find new ways of looking at what they're doing. Uh, so I'd highly recommend reading this book. Um, I would honestly say that uh, reading this book, uh, Mastery by George Leonard, was one of the keys to um, my acquiring skills as rapidly as I did with Poi. Um, it got me on the path to the right practice habits, and it got me on the path to having the right mentality to long-term commitment to a particular skill. So, yeah, check it out. Um, feed 4 kids says, thanks again. That was deep. <laughs> yeah, a, a little bit. I will think about this. You help a lot. Keep inspiring. See you. Enjoy every word you say. Have a great night. Bye, everybody. Bye, Feed. Um, Lucy Bell says, totally recognize the self-employed struggle. Yeah. yeah. Uh, Clayton Stadler says, what is your opinion on drug use and flow arts, specifically drugs in the psychedelic realm? I was going to make a video on this at one point. I actually recorded it, and um, I never published it because I wanted to be able to present my thoughts in a way that got the point across while at the same time not stepping on anybody else's toes. And it felt to me just a little bit too much like I was grinding my own ax. So I do not partake of any substances when I spin. I never have. Um, and uh, that doesn't mean that I, if other people want to do that, I'm not their mom. They can, they can do what they want to with their bodies. I think I, I've seen cases where people have been under the influence of substances in a way that made them dangerous to themselves or others with fire. Um, so that is one flag that I will put in that. But like, the one thing that I, I get stuck on with this is that there are a lot of people who need for their choice to be the only right choice. Um, and I, I have a hard time with that attitude for a lot of reasons, not the least of which that there is such a diversity of people and opinions out there that um, saying there's only one way to be, you know, it feels very limiting and very fundamentalist to me in a lot of ways. And I know that there are lots of people out there who have encountered people who are very fundamentalist in the sense of being anti-drug. Um, I have encountered a lot of people who are very fundamentalist about being pro-drug. That, like, there are tons of people online that when somebody's struggling with a move, the advice they'll give them is, you know, you need to go take a bunch of shrooms or you need to go take acid or something like that. And while I appreciate that there's, like, a desire to help at the core of that, there's also kind of a one-size-fits-all piece to that, where 
I, I don't like the idea of progressing with a prop being dependent upon putting something in your body. Like, it has to come from you. Um, and it's especially disappointing coming from what feel like the whole point of countercultures is, is that we've, we've like been denied a choice at some point that we're in this place because a wider culture has told us that something we enjoy and love is wrong. And so we have found a group of like-minded people to share the things that we love with. And the core of that is being able to pursue what you want and say no to the things that you don't want. That these become your choices and not society's choices. And I embrace the I, I, I embrace people making the choices that are right for them. And it makes me very sad when people treat their choice as the only choice. Um, because it defeats the purpose. Like if 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 we're just going to say that ev that like there's there's no option in the flow arts but to take drugs, then we're right back where the w wider culture left us, and we we haven't we haven't improved on anything. We've just come back to the exact same place. So, for people who enjoy them, enjoy them responsibly. No problem with that. But like, bear in mind that there's a lot of different ways to be. And there is a way to be in here that doesn't involve substances, and that's okay. And for those of you out there, like me, who've had people come at you with that attitude, just know that like there's nothing wrong with sober spinning. You can enjoy spinning with or without substances, and both of those, both of those are the right answer. So, yeah, that is my opinion on drug use in the flow arts. Um, I have known people in the flow arts that have had serious drug problems, and I have known people in the flow arts who have gotten over serious drug problems by spinning. So it's a mixed bag. Um, I think ultimately we have this, we are a microcosm in a lot of ways of the greater society around us. I think we like to think that we've filtered out a lot of the problems, but I think we sometimes give ourselves too much credit for that. I, I think that we haven't done the work of erasing those problems and that it is good to bear in mind that those problems um, don't get solved by denying them, they get solved by working on them day in and day out. Yeah, so I, I, I have no idea if that's what you're hoping to hear or not. Um, and I hope that that doesn't upset any of you guys out there who were hoping that I was gonna tell some great story about tripping and finding you know, my bliss, because that didn't happen. Anyhow, um, Roland Arietta pla plans for more classes soon. I would really, really like to. Um, Flame Festival, unfortunately, got in the way of a lot of my attempts to put together a new class schedule, so I don't think we're going to get there before May. I'm going to try like hell to have more classes uh, coming up in May, though. Um, Unfortunately, the, the time slot that we had before at the studio uh, is no longer available. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to work on it. I really, really, really want to have those in-person classes again. I will keep you posted. Um, everybody who was in the first class, you will get an email when I've got space booked. And, uh, and, and we're, we're doing the next round. Thank you for checking in on that, Roland. Rolando. Cool. So um, it is... 9.05. I had really only intended to do this for about an hour, so I think I'm going to go ahead and wind this down. If any of you guys want to throw any last-minute super chats in, that would be lovely. Um, oh, Kurt Hobbs says, uh, my apologies, I may have made my question too vague. I was more curious to know what hurdles you found most difficult to overcome. Oh, for example, I am struggling to master isolations at the moment. Um, the two biggest hurdles in all of my time spinning the first one was learning how to do two poi one hand. Um, that was that 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 was such a rough process that I almost gave up multiple times. Um, I just could not make the poi do what I wanted them to do, and um, you know the park that I would go practice in for that. People would walk past me, and it'd be this thing that, like, every five minutes, I would literally just throw the poi on the ground in frustration as I was working on two poi one hand. That one was really hard. Um, gunslingers were the other thing that were super difficult for me. Um, but like I had a better attitude about learning gunslingers. I knew right as I was starting on them, 
that uh, that gunslingers were going to be incredibly difficult for me to learn. Um, that they were going to require a lot of time, a lot of focus, a lot of effort, and it wasn't going to be easy. Um, and sure enough, they met my expectations. So um, gunslingers probably took me about as many hours of practice as doing two ploy one hand did. Um, and but the thing was is I got super frustrated with two ploy one hand, and I was a lot more patient with gunslingers because um, they. I, I didn't have an accurate gauge of how difficult two ploy one hand was going to be to learn, um, and I think having gone through two ploy one hand, it gave me a better context for what learning gunslingers was going to be like. Um, so yeah, th those are the two things that I, 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 those were the two hardest things for me to overcome. Um, I've never tried learning ploy juggling, but I imagine that that would be another thing that would be incredibly difficult to to get through. Yeah, cool. So, um, again, I'm going to say thank you to all of you guys out there. Thank you to those of you who left a super chat for me. It is so helpful. Um, and before I sign off, I'm also going to throw a quick thank you out there to all of my supporters over on Patreon because they're the ones that make my videos possible uh, and my channel and all the resources that you guys get to check out possible. Um, so if you'd like to support that work that I do, you can head on over to patreon.com slash drexfactorpoi and sign up. Um, and I would also like to thank the friends of the channel. Currently, there are six of them. Oh, they are um, Dark Monk, Amazing Lights, Flow Toys, uh, Spin Sconson, Spin Balls, and Ultra Poi. Um, these wonderful companies have decided that the work I do is worth them supporting. So I just want to thank all of them for um, helping me out and for helping me to keep on producing these videos and for believing in me enough to think that what I do is a resource for this community. Thank you one and all. And with that, I am going to sign off for the night, my friends. Thank you one and all for your wonderful questions and uh, keep your eyes out for more videos on the horizon. Um, in the works right now, I have videos on um, using isopropyl rubbing alcohol for a uh, fire spinning fuel. It does work with some caveats. You'll find out more in the video. Um, I've got reviews for a couple different new sets of poi. Um, and uh, what else? I think after tonight I might actually do a video on how to uh, warm up arms and avoid shoulder injuries because that's something that's come up in multiple Q&A sessions now. Yeah, so be on the lookout for all that. Uh, Lucy Bell says it's 2 a.m. in the UK. I should really sleep, but I got very intrigued on the topics. <laughs> Have a good night and can't wait for the new videos. Have a good night too, Lucy. You, uh, you you sleep well, okay? Anna says, can you share some greetings to Ilja, your biggest fan? Ilja. Hello, Ilja. Uh, thank you for tuning in, and uh, uh, thank you for being a part of this wonderful community. Yeah? And thank you all for being a part of this wonderful community. I will see you very soon. Uh, in videos uh, on my channel and hopefully do another live chat like this in the not too distant future. Peace guys.